Shalom family. Viewer update. The Benaya Israel channel is moving over to Rumble. Please join us over on our new platform. You can find a link in the description to our new Rumble channel called Hidden Hebrews. Hope to see you there, family. Shalom. Shalom, shalom, Israel. Peace and blessings, peace and blessings. Hopefully everyone's doing doing tobe or good. Uh, hey, family, if you could help me just do a, a quick uh, audio check. If my audio sounds okay, if you could, please put a one in the chat. If the audio sounds fine, uh, please put a one in the chat. Just want to make sure that I'm broadcasting on, um, we are live on YouTube and on Rumble. Thank you, thank you, thank you, fam. I see a bunch of ones in the chat. Told I, told I, told I. Thank you for that, family. All right, so I'm just going to take a, uh, just give me one minute, family. I'm just going to take a quick peek over on these other platforms just to make sure we're live. So just give me one minute. So I'm just going to pop over to, to, let me check Rumble. Because sometimes, family, when, you, when you're setting these things up, uh, the live can get cut on it so let's see i'm over on rumble and let's see hit hebrews there we go all right so live on rumble praise you and then let me uh go over to the benaya channel on youtube just want to make sure we're good here as well there we go youtube all right, yeah, because I think the last time I did a live, uh, YouTube ended up cutting the the live on it. So yeah, family, if you haven't uh, moved over to Rumble or subscribed over on Rumble, I would really, really encourage you to do so. Um, you know, one of the things we, you know, I really haven't gone into detail about, and that is the reason why we're moving off of YouTube. So just to give you a quick, a, a quick uh, summary, right before we get started. So the reason why we're moving over to YouTube. Most people don't know that YouTube and the ADL are connected at the hip. And what I mean by that is back is that is that all the way back to 2008, YouTube and the ADL came together and they did two things, family. And this these are two things that impacts the way that your traffic and your views and your likes and your your um how can i put it your references not references your referrals what they yeah what uh referrals gets handled in youtube and so what they did all the way, and this like i said this goes all the way back to 2008 is that they came together and they started they started crafting youtube's policy so the adl started helping youtube craft its policy on hate on and What's what's significant about that is that the policy on hate was was the ADL's uh, definition of the policy of hate. Right. You have to kind of keep that in mind when, you know, as we're, we're talking about this. But the ADL helped YouTube craft its policy on hate. That's the first issue. Right. <clears throat> right. Why are they using this organization that has been historically hostile to African Israelites to come up with policies on YouTube? Right. That's one. The second the second uh, issue or the second problem that they that they've come together and done is that once that policy was in place, uh, the ADL was then moved into this uh, this position. I believe they call it like a I don't have the information in front of me, but it's like a, a referral, a referred partner or something like that. Uh, basically, they gave YouTube a seat at the table uh, as far as being able to report what the ADL felt was hate. So the ADL has a direct line or connection into YouTube for them to, to point out videos and channels that they believe are hate, are hate 
uh, channels based off of the ADL's definition of hate. So that's two. And then the third thing that happens, and this is the, the one that that I, I believe bears or requires legal action. And that is what happens is that YouTube then does one of two things. They'll either, re, you know, remove the channel, you know, they'll put a um, a a, um, a strike on it. Right. And or they'll remove the channel or they will they will do what's referred to as deamplifying the channel. So when I say deamplifying the channel, uh, it's it has to do with, with like their recommendation algorithm. Basically, they they stop uh, advertising your your content, your videos to other people. Like you could let's say for instance, you if you post a video, you know normally if if YouTube doesn't suppress your channel, normally your video will go out to you know a, a plethora of folks on the YouTube, in the YouTube community. But whenever they they enable this suppression on your channel, then according to YouTube, it can on average reduce the traffic, the views to your channel roughly 80%, right? So, and that's that's big, at least for the people that are monetized. Like, so if your channel's monetized and you're running commercial, commercials on your channel, YouTube with the with the backing of the ADL or the direction of the ADL, because remember the ADLs, they're the ones that's reporting this, you know, who they feel is hate, what channels they feel is hate to YouTube. And then they're and then they're encouraging YouTube to act upon this information that they just gave to them. Right. This is and this can uh, in turn cause an 80, roughly an 80 percent reduction on people's channels. So. And, and the thing is, like I said, family, is that when this 80 percent occurs, YouTube does not let you know that they are suppressing your channel 80 percent. And as a user on this platform, you know, I believe that you are entitled to know if someone is reducing or if they if the if the owner company organization is reducing revenues, views to your channel, 80 percent. You know, you're at least owed that, right? You're at least, they at least should give you some sort of notification, but we know that that, that does not happen. So I, like I said, I believe that, that that bears or requires some sort of legal legal action. But that's, that's part of the reason why we're moving off of YouTube because when we move over to Rumble, we see a totally different pattern. Like when we go over to Rumble, and, and let's say for instance, if I have a thousand subscribers over in Rumble, well, that usually equates to over a thousand views on a on a video. In other words, Rumble doesn't suppress the way that YouTube does. So long story short, family, that's why we're trying to get over to Rumble. Also, because the ADL has had uh, has helped YouTube craft its hate policy. Uh, that's why, you know, a lot of platforms are in jeopardy of being getting strikes on YouTube because the ADL is so intertwined into their policy and into their enforcement. So just a heads up on that, family. All right. Well, uh, sorry to go down, go down that rabbit hole, but just wanted to share that information with your family just to let you know why we're moving over to Rumble and some of these other platforms. Because I think the more platforms we're on, probably you know the better. But all right. Well, peace and blessings, peace and blessings. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Glad everyone could join. Hopefully everybody had a great and awesome Shabbat see a bunch of folks in the chat shalom 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 hopefully everyone's doing well all right so the purpose of this uh of this lesson and this is a, a lesson i haven't really seen anybody do this lesson before uh maybe touch on on bits and, and pieces of it and actually as I, I do that let me bring up my uh powerpoint slide here i always got to throw this this disclaimer disclaimer out there right so you know, we're gonna gonna be talking about some some issues, family. So definitely, if, if you're sensitive to uh, issues of civil rights or racism, then you know this this live or presentation is not for you. All right, but and also just a, a quick shout out as far as like the African Israelite Justice Foundation. Uh, here's the updated information. We do have a, a number to go along with the the contact info and. I forgot to put the um, the QR code on there. So most I will in, in some uh, in broadcast to come broadcast in the future. I'll put a QR code so that if you have a if you have like a phone, you can just scan that QR code and you'll get the you'll get all this information. You won't have to write it down or anything like that. 
All right. All right. So just a shout out to the African Israelite Justice Foundation. Uh, we are moving, family. Like I said, we are moving in the background. Lawyers are contacting companies. <laughs> I can tell you that much for sure. Uh, our lawyers are contacting big organizations, right? And they're they're going back and forth with their lawyers. And already there's some movement. I can tell you that much. Already there's some movement. I, I don't want to get ahead of what's going on. But I, like I said, I can tell you that we are moving. Conversations are happening. Websites are changing. Right. Uh, and eventually some litigations will follow. So most high willing, uh, we will have some additional information on that. However, like I said, it's still in the, you know, in the process It's just not ready to be announced or, or released just yet. But eventually we will have a uh, just to give you a heads up, we will have a um, like a fun, fun, uh, a fundraiser drive. And the purpose of that is to be able to uh, fund a bigger pool of lawyers in order to go after some of these bigger organizations. And also uh, because of these, these what these bigger organizations like to do, like if they lose a, a case, what they'll do is that they'll just appeal to the higher court. Right. And they'll keep doing that all the way up to the Supreme Court. And most high willing, if we have the funding to do to, you know, to follow follow that path, uh, we will do so. And so it, in, in unfortunately, family, it does cost to be able to follow uh, the appeals all the way up to the, to the Supreme Court. So this is why we're having uh, we're going to have some fundraisers lined up in the next month or month or two, because we have to have the funds in order to be able to, to match the uh, appeals of the companies that we're going after. So that is it. But thank you. For, you know, thank you in advance for all those who have already donated. Thank you for those who are considering donating. And like I said, family, you know, I'm all about results. So most high willing, we'll be able to uh, share some results here with you soon. Hallelujah. All right. Well, on to our topic at hand. Who's in Africa? Who is in Africa? And you might be saying, all right, well, Brother Benai, why are you why are you worried about who's in Africa? Right. And so it has a, a lot to do with, um, you know, the especially here here for us in the States. Right. You know, we're we're in, you know, and I know people are, are from in the Israelite community. You know, we believe different things. Right. And that's a, that's the thing about, you know, the African Israelite Justice Foundation. You know, we work with all groups of all you know different faiths, different, different beliefs. Right. Because we know that Israel is in different places in their walk, in their understanding. And so we don't necessarily shun those, you know, uh, people because they have a different belief than us. But I, but I will since we're talking about a family, I will put this out there that just because they're on the Benaya Israelite uh, Israel channel or some other platforms doesn't mean that I am endorsing what they believe. Right. It doesn't mean that I'm co-signing off that. You know, you've heard people say, chew the meat, spit off, spit out the bone. Right. So just want to make sure we're we're on the same page as, as, as that's concerned, because, you know, here on the Benaya Israel Israel channel, just so that everyone knows, and like I said, I know that uh, people that are dialed in may have different uh, beliefs, but just so that you know that where I'm coming from and where my, you know, our bias, you know, lies. So our bias is, is that when it comes to, you know, the whole, you know, going back to, to Africa, I believe that eventually at some point we will leave America. Right. And, and I know like that, like I said, there's different thoughts as far as like whether America is the, is the daughter of Babylon. Some, some people believe that it's the Catholic church. Right. But, well, you know, I believe that America is part of the the daughter of Babylon system and that at some point she will she will be judged and we will be forced to leave. Whether you believe whether you want to stay or go, you're going to be forced to leave at some point. Right. So that's what you know, that's what I believe. That's what we teach on, on the channel. And to that end, um, eventually, I do believe that we will end up back somewhere on the continent in Africa. Uh, that's one. <clears throat> but the, the question that will that I think separates a lot of Israelite communities is when when do you go back to Africa? Because you got some folks that want to go before uh, Babylon gets judged or during the time that Babylon gets judged or after the Babylon, the time that Babylon gets judged. So there's three groups of Israelites or three categories that Israelites usually fall in that they believe in. They either believe that uh, Israel leaves before Babylon gets judged during the time that Babylon gets judged 
or after Babylon gets judged. And we'll take a look at look, look we'll take a look at at some of that uh, here in a, in a moment. And I'll show you that why why you know I believe that it's going to be af afterwards. I think that we're going to be here to see Babylon gets judged. And there are scriptures that I'll, I'll also show with share with you to, to uh, show you that. Uh, as we're going out the door, we're going to be taking some stuff with us. <laughs> so, but again, like I said, that's just my belief. And I don't bang people over the head because they believe differently. Right. We're all in different, different places on that. So not a, you know, not a game, uh, deal breaker, uh, for me. Right. So that's one thing. And then the other, other thing that, you know, that I push that, I, that on this, on the Benai Israelite channel, and you've seen me, heard me teach on, teach on this before. And that is, you know, where the where Israel is. Right. And of course, you you know that there, for the most part, there's two thoughts on that. You know, uh, some people believe it's in you know South Africa, Central Africa. You know, take your pick. Uh, I believe it's, it's in northeast Africa, which is over in the, the um, you know, north of 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 Egypt. And the reason being is is literally because of the scriptures that start off with the words, thus says Yahuwah. I mean, it literally starts. I'm not just saying that so thus says Yahuwah, but it literally starts off with thus says Yahuwah. And for me, those scriptures are some of the most important scriptures in Torah. The ones that start off with thus says Yahuwah and the thus says Yahuwah scriptures or verse uh, also describes the boundaries of Israel. And when it talks about the boundaries of Israel, it also tells you where the boundaries of Israel are like. If it's on the north side, when it talks about the Euphrates, it talks about the Euphrates being on the east side, on the north side. It talks about uh, Egypt being on the south side. And it also talks about certain seas and stuff being boundaries as, as well. It also talks about Damascus being on the north side. And according to those thus says Yahuwah scriptures, that's why I believe that Israel is on the to the north of Africa. Right. But again, that's just me. <laughs> again, I don't beat people up over the head because they believe differently than I do. And in fact, we might have some folks on the channel that will have a different belief. And that's fine. And again, but I'm not endorsing it. But just know that we have a we have a different belief when it comes to that. So all that being said, family, that kind of plays a part in, you know, our belief in going back over to Africa, like we said, you know, some people want to go before the the uh, judgment of the daughter of Babylon. Some people want to go during. Some people want to go after. And regardless of of when you go, um, you know, regardless of when you go, I believe that there are some there, there's there's some information you probably want to know before you get on the boat or the plane to come over to Africa. Just as a FYI, <laughs> and that's the that's the point. Of this video, because I think there's a there's this uh, misconception that, you know, especially over here in the States, you know, a lot of our persecution has come from a people that look a certain way that aren't black. Right. Now, let me say that again. Over here in the States, a lot of the persecution comes from people that do not look like us. Right. I mean, there are don't get me wrong. There are some black and black crimes in the States, but you don't see us marching in the streets because of some black on black crime that just occurred. Usually you see black folks marching in the streets, especially here in over the United States, because there was a police officer, like a white police officer gunned down a person that had a little kid that had skills in a, in a, uh, in sweet tea. Right. Uh, or a, a, a police officer on the neck of George, George Floyd. Right. While he says, I can't breathe. Right. So, because that has been, and also, I guess when you think about slavery as well, also those pictures of slavery are of the people of the Euro, the white European descent, you know, you know, uh, enslaving and persecuting the uh, the dark skinned melanated people over here in the States. So that's why it is so ingrained in our minds that the enemies of Israel, the people that persecute Israel have a certain look over here in the States so that when we want to leave here right when we want to uh abandon ship <laughs> by all cost at all at all costs right and go over to someplace else whether it be africa or or, or someplace else you know we in our mind we think that whoo man if i could just get away from these you know from the white europeans man by the time and, and you get over to a a place that has all black folks whether it be jamaica haiti uh africa you know pick the black continent right and you get and you and you get there a black place, but you you get there and you see all black folks. Whew, 
you're letting out you, you know you for the emas you're letting out your hair for the brothers you 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 you're letting down your guard you're laying your spear down you're like man i made it from them folks whoo i'm in safe safe haven all right but what i want to warn you family is, is that before you do that let me show you who's there in africa Right. Before, you know, when we, before we go to Africa, because like I said, I believe that at some point we are all going to be heading back over to the continent. Right. But the purpose of this lesson is to show you who's in Africa. And it's not a compre it's not a comprehensive lesson, but it's just a just to kind of give you a summary of, of some of the groups that are in Africa and, and the ones that you have to watch out for, according to the Bible. Right. Because some of these groups are biblical groups that have a biblical issue with Israel. Right. And then the other thing is, family, if you think you're going to run away from these curses, you know, I mean, you know, family, that ain't happening. Right. That is not happening. If the purpose of you trying to run away from from the daughter of Babylon or America now is that you're trying to get away from the curses of Deuteronomy 28, 15 on down. You know, family, that is not going to happen. And what I'm going to share with you, family, let me see if I can expand my screen here. Hang on one second. What I'm going to uh, share with you, family, is this has happened before. Right. And, you know, if you're if you have seen any of the, the videos on this platform, on this channel, you have seen that, you know, a lot of the the uh, lessons we focus on the, the Jews or the Yehudi or the Israelites of Spain and Portugal. Right. And the reason why we do that is because in Spain and Portugal, just before the transatlantic slave trade, a a an event of biblical proportions happened in Spain and Portugal. And it, and it, and it involved hundreds of thousands of black folks and a displacement of black folks, a per persecution of black folks. And these black folks were called Negroes before the word Negro meant Africa. Let me say that again. The the persecution of these hundreds of thousands of black folks that were called Negroes in Spain and Portugal happened at a time before the word Negro meant African, right? And so on this channel, what we try to do is that we try to teach you that history that occurred just before the transatlantic slave trade by the exact same countries that started the transatlantic slave trade to show you that they were persecuting the same people of the transatlantic slave trade in their country. Like literally when you look at the um, at the edict or the the, the decree of the I think it's like the, the, the king of Spain at the time. He literally said Negroes. But again, like I said, Negroes didn't mean African until 1555. And this document was written, in, I believe, in like 1501 or 15, yeah, 1501 or something like that. So. The, the word Negro literally meant someone from Spain and Portugal. But just to show you, like I said, the reason why, I'm, again, the reason why I'm bringing this up is to show you that we have had a history of trying to run, run away from the curses and it has not worked well for us. What ended up happening in the end was that them curses ended up showing up where we where we moved to. Right. I mean, you know, this family. But let's just let's just go through this family. You'll see. Let's check it out. Let's, it says. This is talking about the Jews in Spain and Portugal. And it says the Western Jews pretend moreover that some of the most considerable families of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin went and settled in Sephard or Spain. And that it is among them that the royal line is best preserved. Hallelujah. And let me just pause right here, family, because. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that, you know, we call that we try to call out and uh, shout out to uh, Chief uh, Yahusha uh, with Rebirth, because he, he also has a lot of information on this as well. But one of the things we, we point try to point out to you, family, is that in Spain and Portugal, they had a policy. This was like an Inquisition policy where, where when it, you know, when it. Well, first of all, the the book that the policies were contained in was called the Black Book or the Negro Libro. I'm not Spanish, so forgive me if I'm messing up the pronunciation of this of the of the, uh, of the words here. But but basically, the one of the names was called the Black Book, right? That was going against these black people. And oh, hang on, let me get my screen back up. 
And within this, you know, within this black book, it listed the crimes that that these Israelites could, you know, uh, that the, that these Israelites or people in Spain and Portugal um, would, you know, could occur or uh, uh, offend. And that it also gave the punishment for those crimes. And when we looked at the punishment of the crimes, one of the things that we pointed out, and you can also find this in that the movie Reclaiming the Thrones, I, I really would encourage you to check out the, the movie Reclaiming the Thrones. That's by uh, Big Chief uh, Moshe and Yahusha. They did an excellent, excellent job in putting this, this documentary together. But in Reclaiming the Thrones, one of the things that's pointed out in that movie is that the punishment in this this black book the book of the inquisition against these black people in spain and portugal the punishment that was reserved for the nobles hallelujah listen to me family the punishments that was reserved for the nobles was expulsion was expulsion so basically family they were taking the nobles out of spain and portugal and expelling them where were they expelling them to the west coast of africa just before and during the transatlantic slave trade that's why when you look at the the transatlantic slave trade and these people get shipped over to the americas they eventually get end up over in north america uh due to certain pressures that occurred in south america but a lot of these folks get uh over, you know pushed over to uh, north america this is why when the the people over in the United States hit their 400 year mark. This is why all hell broke loose. And I've heard I've had people uh, mention to me. They said, "Hey, brother Benaya, you know uh, the is you know the Israelites are sorry, or the the Negroes were over in South America longer." I was like, "Yep, they were. You know, they were there longer than 400 years." I was like, "Yes, they were." It's like, "Oh, brother, brother Benaya, the Israelites were over in uh, uh, you know some of these other." Uh, Central Central American companies way before they got to they got to uh, North America. It's like, yep, you're, you're right about that, brother Benaya. The Israelites. I mean, we, we see some 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 black folks, some Israelites in North America before 1619. I'm like, yep, I agree with you. I agree with you there. But the the key here is family, and this is what I tell people. It's like the key is who is here and when they got here which is which which is key and and which is why when we hit our 400 year anniversary here in the states that all hell broke loose i actually use that point against them. i, I say that yeah you're right so when 400 years struck uh, when the 400 year uh, time clock struck uh 12 in brazil did all hell break loose in brazil no nope. when all when the 400 year time clock struck 12 struck midnight in central america did uh, all hell break loose in central america no nope. But when the time clock struck 400 years over in North America, all hell broke loose, right? Yes, it did. <laughs> and that's because of who is here. Remember, who is here? And that's because the, the uh, Inquisition had a policy of expelling the nobles, right? Expelling the nobles. And that's who I believe is, is here in bulk in the, in the U.S. or in the Americas. And let me go down a, a few advance, a few more slides. Like I said, the, the reason why I was bringing up this slide is just to show you that in Spain and Portugal, in Spain and Portugal, you know, we were there, our, our, a lot of our, our, our family was in Spain and Portugal just before the transatlantic slave trade kicked out. And the reason why, if you're wondering like, all right, so why is there a whole bunch of Israelites over in Spain and Portugal? Well, that's because it's kind of like the same thing, family. Israel was being persecuted all over the place, right? Those curses of Deuteronomy 15, it's like that, it's like that belt when somebody's getting spanked. Like, like the most high was whooping Israel all over the place. And the one place that they thought that the most high's belt wasn't coming down on was Spain and Portugal. Like that was the haven. Like this, like in if you don't know the history in 711 AD, you know, the Moors and the Israelites, because it wasn't just the Moors, they usually leave out the Israelites, but the Moors and the Israelites conquered Spain. Right. Conquered Spain and, and Portugal. And when that occurred, family, there was a, a utopia. There was a peace. There was a shalom because, you know, immediately after the victory, you know, the Muslim get the Muslims and you have the Israelites living side by side in peace and shalom. 
the Muslims weren't weren't bothering the Israelites. The Israelites weren't bothering bothering the Muslims. In fact, some of the the cities the Muslims just gave over to the Israelites, like Granada being one of them. And this is why when I tell people, it's like when you run your DNA on this uh, this website called MyTrueAncestry.com, one of the matches that a lot of so-called African Americans and Negroes around the world, you're getting a match in Granada, Spain, is that is literally the city of the Israelites, not not just any Israelites, the Southern Kingdom of Israel, the house of the house of Judah. So a lot of us are, are having those matches in the same territories that the Israelites controlled in Spain and Portugal. And it was, you know, during this time, we, you know, our forefathers were, were over in Spain and a lot of our brethren in these the surrounding co countries heard about this utopia, this peace, this shalom that was happening in Spain and Portugal. And they were like, man, we, well, we're getting worked over here, man. We, we got it. We got to go where you guys are. And that's why and that's where you had this this massive influx of Israelites uh, flooding into Spain. They were trying to do the same thing they were trying to do here, family. They were trying to flee from their persecution. And so they made it into Spain. Whew. Oh, thank goodness, man. The most high's belt, man. That well, he most high don't play when he when he bring that belt down on you, does he? So our people has fled into Spain and Portugal. And here, family, this is just uh, let's see here. I think this is okay. Okay, yeah. This reason why I, I kind of just grabbed some of my old slides here, but this this one was talking about the Israelites over in Spain. You know, just coming over into Spain, and, and that the a lot of the Israelites in Spain trace literally trace their lineage back to the house of David, right? And it says, but to come to the rabbinical authorities of Barbanel in his commentary on Zechariah. You know, says Yahuwah also shall save the tents of Yehuda, affirms that at the desolation of the first temple, two families of the house of David came to settle in Spain. One at Lucina. Like, remember, I was telling you about there are certain cities that the that the uh, Israelites were in. Lucina is one of them. And it says in the other at Seville, believe it or not, Seville is one of them. And from these came thousands of all sheep. So basically, family, during that time, that utopia, during that time of peace and shalom, man, you know how we do, family. Israelite multiplies, just like we did in Egypt. We were doing the same thing in Spain and Portugal. We were multiplying. And that's why by the time it was time for Israel to get kicked out almost 700 years later, there was a bunch of Israelites being kicked out <laughs> of Spain and Portugal. And this is just another um you know, reference that talks about the Israelites in Spain and Portugal being of the house of David. It says, uh, King Alfonso, once we may learn, if we can believe it, that the king of Spain who had assisted Nebuchadnezzar in reducing Jerusalem brought an enormous population into Spain, all from either the family of David or at least from the tribe of Judah, and that the royal family resided first in Seville, then in Granada. Granada, the, uh, the alternate name for the city of Granada is, is Jewstown. Granada was literally called Jewstown. And it says, adding that the exiles afterwards had their numbers greatly increased by fugitives from the desolation of the second temple. So basically, family, is what it's saying is that the population in Spain swelled over time. That's what I was telling you, fam. Like everybody that was an Israelite, you know, in general, wanted to get over into Spain and Portugal because they were getting their tails kicked in these these other places right there the, the most highest belt and punishments was coming down on israel in these other places and to show you how exact and precise you know the the israelites over in spain and portugal know that they know that they know that they know that they are the people of the book so unlike us over here in the states they have their lineage right they know who their father was who their granddaddy was, who the great granddaddy was, who the great 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 granddaddy was, all the way back to King David himself. Let me say that again, all the way back to King David himself. And this is this is just one example where you see this is the the a, a, a single branch in the Yahya family, and this is in German, right? But it says it says Das Jasha, but really it's Yahya, right? It's Yahya. And it's and it's 
basically what this one does is that it traces the lineage all the way back. And if you go up to the top of the screen and if you look hard enough, you'll see the word David in Germany. If you keep looking somewhere in there, you'll see King Solomon in Germany. And if you keep looking, you'll notice that these same people also went also were the same of the same lineage of the people that were placed that went into captivity in into Babylon. Right. So these same people that were over in Spain and Portugal, they were of the same lineage or descent of the people that were uh, captured uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. Same people. Right. Which is like I said, which is interesting not to go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> but family, it's, it's just so much information because you even, even have the limba. Right. The limba will tell you that, yes, we also were in Babylon, uh, taken into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. Right. And of course, the limba didn't come didn't come into back over into the continent until late. Like people don't realize that the limbas were the, the were, was one of the last tribes to come into Africa. People don't realize that, but it's, it's part of their oral oral tradition, right? And for a lot of people that, you know, a lot of uh, so-called African-Americans, so-called black folks, when we run our, our DNA test and we look at the genetic distance value, not, you know, not just any genetic value, but the genetic distance value, that shows you how closely you, re you are related to somebody. It tells you that, it, it shows you if that person is your daddy or if that person is your fourth cousin. Right. Because we got a lot of fourth cousins and fifth cousins and sixth and seventh generation removed cousins all spread out all over in Africa. But you only got one daddy. Right. And for a lot of folks that when you run your genetic distance value, you show that genetic distance value that your closest match are the are the limba who also were taken into Babylon. Right. Who also were taken into Babylon. And so how does that tie into what we're talking about now? Well, if you look on the screen, remember I just told you that these the Jews or the Israelites of Spain and Portugal, they know that they know that they know their lineage. Like they're not like us, family. They didn't forget. Like they knew who they were. And this is and I, like I say, family, it's so much information that you come across when you're studying this stuff that like I even came across things because you hear people talk about, you know, giving Hamashiach, the Mashiach, a hard time and, and saying things like, oh, they, 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 the, the Europeans, gonna, they made up uh, Hamashiach. They made up uh, Jesus. Right. When they did make up Jesus now, but they didn't make up Yahushua. Now that's that's something that's something different. <laughs> that's something different. Uh, but saying all the saying all that to say, family, you know, and most I willing, you know, I'll, I'll bring we'll, we'll, we'll do like a lesson on this and and just show you that some of these old references talk about how these Israelites who did not forget who they were, who knew their lineage all the way back to King David, they had a sit down and a talk about Yahushua about who he was, who he is, what they what he meant what he means or meant to the body of Israel and what they should do about it. That is in in a, a couple of uh, references and in order to uh attend this big conference that they had where they were discussing this uh the only way that people could have a discussion or even to have a vote is that they had to have their lineage and uh and be able to prove it. You know, before this this um how can I put it? This council of Israel, like they had to go before the council and be like, look, it's my daddy. It's my granddaddy. It's my blah, 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 all the way back to King David. Or some of them may, may not have gone back to King David, but at the very least, they had to show that they were Israelites. And uh, they were talking about Yahushua and they weren't talking about him being fake. Right. They weren't talking about him, about the, is the Europeans um, making making him up like that wasn't even a conversation. The only conversation that they were trying to figure out is who was he? Like they like they knew that he had powers, but they were trying to they were trying to um, equate it to magic. Like, oh, maybe the stuff that he was doing was magic, you know, stuff like that. But anyway, like I said, I don't want to get off into a tangent, but just let you know, like when you're studying this stuff, family, you come across information. And because I, I, I try to stay focused on the topic at hand, you know, I just I usually just take it and just save it. <laughs> so most I will. And we'll probably, you know, maybe we can do a, a study on you who should. And so that you can see that. The people of Spain and Portugal, the, the the Israelites who did not forget who they were, they weren't dogging out Yahushua. Like that wasn't a thing. Right. The other people that were there in the meeting were the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, just like they were doing in the Bible, just like they were trying to they were dogging out Yahushua in the Bible. They were they were dogging out Yahushua in this meeting. So anyway, like I said, it, it'll be a, a good study. But let's, let me bring it back. 
All right, so on the screen, family, you're looking at the Yayas. The Yayas eventually changed their names to Negro. And this is, like I said, this is before the word Negro meant someone that was born in Africa. Before the word Negro meant someone that was born in Africa, the word Negro referred to the Yayas. And the Yayas were the people that were placed in charge of all the Israelites in Spain and Portugal, or at least we thought that. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that here in a moment. And so the Yayas eventually, you know, did what Israel does, multiplied, and you end up having a bunch of Negroes <laughs> running around Spain and Portugal that were the head noble people in Spain and Portugal. And then, of course, transatlantic slave trade gets kicked out or gets kicked off. All this persecution, persecution even comes against the Yayas. We know that the Yayas fled into Africa because one of the things that we looked at was you can t actually go and purchase a Sephardic uh, Israelite uh, dictionary. Basically, what that book is, is that it shows you surnames. It shows you the last names of Israelites. And actually, the the whole this whole notion of last names like people because you know in the bible israelites didn't have last names it, it, it wasn't like it wasn't like elijah jenkins it wasn't like um uh, um uh, <laughs> david david uh jenkins right it was just david it was shaul right it was isaiah but the this whole uh notion and practice of surnames was birthed out of spain and portugal even the Ashkenaz did not have surnames. It was the the uh, um, the Spanish and Portuguese Jews that have surnames. And then eventually, all these other Jews started having surnames. But don't get it twisted, family. It started off in Spain and Portugal. But anyway, let me bring it back. Let me bring it back. Keep going off on a tangent. So in Spain and Portugal, these yayas eventually became known as Negroes before the word Negro meant someone from Spain and Portugal. And you can, like I said, you can also look at this, this, uh, <clears throat> look at this, you know, this is, this is one of those uh, genealogy uh, tables or maps or listings of the Yahya family all the way back to King David. And you, and the Yahya lineage was also in captivity in Babylon. That's what this, this uh, German genealogy table of the Yahya shows you. All right. And even in Spain and Portugal, they even had a land called the Negroes before the word Negro meant an African. There was a land, a territory over in Spain and Portugal called the land of the Negroes. Before slavery kicked off. They had a land called the Negroes, the land of the Negroes. And in this one, let's see, uh, I guess I, I just kind of put this one in here just to show you that. Uh, and this is like a, this like, like I said, this talk, this speaks to the curses because this is speaks to when people think that you're going to run away from the curses. Like eventually in Spain and Portugal, that utopia uh, got cold. Right. Eventually the curses showed up. It's like, oh, I didn't realize I was up here in Spain and Portugal. How come y'all didn't invite me? You know, the, the, cur the curses said as it came through the front door and then the curses did what the curse is going to do. Right. The curses started uh, causing. Um, um, it, you know, started causing plagues to, to, to pop off in Spain and Portugal. And guess what? When the plagues, when the plagues kicked off among these Negroes, guess what they called the, the name of the plagues? Black plague, right? They called it the black plague. And this is funny because, uh, you know, you have all these, you have all these uh, descriptions of things. And when, when it talks about the Israelites of Spain and Portugal, it always somehow, some way comes back to the word black. You know, Black Plague, you know, or the book that they were persecuting was you know, the Black Book, a town that they lived in was called the Black Town. <laughs> Come on, family. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, and then and then to have the audacity after all these, you know, these synonyms, these 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 descriptions of black, black, black and black. And then to have the audacity to, to say that they were white. Family, you have to realize how how big of a. Uh, you have to stress the truth so so much to try to even try to even get there. But anyway, but let's leave that one alone for now, family. But like I said, family, the curses in Spain and Portugal eventually showed up, knocked on the door. You know, it caused some plagues to kick off. It caused the persecution to kick off. Now, 
guess what Israel's going to do? We're going to run away again. Man, we can't we can't handle this. And a lot of them went over to Africa. And just as when they went over to Spain, they thought they were getting away from the, you know, getting away from these uh, per, from the curses. Guess what happened when they went over to Africa? Like this is this is the probably the third or fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh time we fled to Africa. We do, we've done this throughout the scriptures, family. We've done this throughout the scriptures. So this this flee to Africa thing isn't something new. Even even Hamashiach had to do it right. He had to go down to Egypt while he was while they were uh, looking for him and trying to persecute him in in um, Israel. Right. So this isn't something new. And this is why I'm not like I'm not knocking anyone for wanting to do it, family. I just want to give you some information that you will definitely need to know before you go, because here over in the States, things have been so whitewashed. Our persecutions have been, you know, of a certain phenotype, you know, usually white Europeans that we think that when we see a black folks, we can let our guard down and we think that everything's going to be cool. And I just let, let me just share some information for you and you can read it for yourself. Hallelujah. All right. So as Israel was going from Spain back into Africa or from Portugal back into Africa, this is what they were concerned about. It's like if they should go over to Africa as it is possible, as it is possible, they would even they said they would, if driven from Portugal, all hopes of their conversion would be lost. So basically the folks in Spain and Portugal, they were worried. It's like, man, if, if these Israelites leave, you know, we can't convert them over to this our Roman uh, Roman Catholicism. We can't convert them to our brand of Christianity. Man, we, we got to do something. And to the point, family, that when people don't know is this is like when Emmanuel, King Emmanuel set up, sent his people into Africa to, you know, start getting getting, quote unquote, these slaves. The first slaves were called rescues they were called rescues i'm doing air quotes you can't see me <laughs> and it and uh and it has to do family with and the reason why they're calling them rescues it has to do with a promise that he promised to the israelites before you know when his father uh king john the second actually sent them into africa anyway that's like i said long story short but long story short family israel goes and flees into africa you know, they're there. And, and again, just so that you know that uh, there are books, old books. And, you know, if you're new to the channel, uh, one of the things that we push, we tell people is that if you want to know the true history of who Israel is, where Israel came from, what happened to them, you got to read old books. You got to read books where the, the publication date is older than, uh, I'd say, like 1850 in general. Right. That's not a hard, fast rule, but in general. Find you a book where the publication date is older than 1850. And, you know, nine times out of 10, those books will describe Israelites from Spain and Portugal as black, as brown, dark skinned, swarthy, you know, any synonyms you can think of black. That's what they would be described of in those books. And that is a consistent, repeatable thing that you can find on your own. Right. Um, where you will find other Israelites of different complexions or people that were calling themselves Israelites or Jewish is in Germany because in Germany, depending on how far back you go in time on the north side of Germany, you will find white Germans. I mean, you'll find white Jews, but on the south side, you'll find black Jews, you know, usually in the, the area of uh, Bavaria, Bavaria, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, close to like the Rhineland and stuff like that, where a bunch of persecution kicked off. But that's a story for another day. So. It, you know, the reason why I'm showing you this reference family is just to show you that all that persecution that kicked off curses showed up. Right. And guess what? Israel was back in Africa. You know, before this, we were over in we were over in Spain. We were over in France. We were over in Europe. We were over in Italy. Right. But then knock, knock, knock. Curses showed up. <laughs> right. Curses showed up. And let's see what happens. There's many Jews also were scattered over this region and some native boasting themselves of Abraham's seed. So basically it's, it's saying that in Africa at this time, this is in, this book was written in the 1600s. Uh, you can, there was a, a large contingency of Israelites in Africa near the Niger river. You know, they were inhabiting both sides of the Niger river. And it says others are Asian strangers who fled thither either from the desolation of Jerusalem by Vespasian 
or the uh, Judah wasted and depopulated by the Romans. So another thing I tell people is that there were waves of Israelites. They came over different times, right? Different events occurred that caused Israelites to get expelled from wherever they were, came over to uh, Africa, to the west coast of Africa. And the last people to show up on the west coast of Africa were those Israelites from Spain and Portugal. And not only were they placed over in Spain and Portugal, they were scattered family. And that's a that's an important uh, differentiation. The Israelites that came over to Spain and Portugal were scattered in the places that Portugal had their dominion. They were scattered in places where Portugal had their dominion. That's why when you take a 23andMe or Ancestor.com, you'll start to say things like, oh, man, I, I'm like 40 percent Nigerian. I'm like 35 percent Cameroon. I'm 15 uh, percent Ghanaian. What you're picking up is the scattering of Israel in those places. So, of course, you'll have 30 percent this, 40 percent that. Even if you take an African Ancestry.com test. And what they do is that they look at your Y chromosome and they say that, well, let me look to see where we can find your Y chromosome in, in Africa. Like, where's your your uh, your your father? Right. In Africa. And they'll say, look, oh, we, you came back. You came back as uh, a uh, just a Yoruba. Yeah, we found that found that your your daddy is in, is in Yoruba. And again, family, that's because you were scattered. Right. Your, your, your forefathers were scattered among the among the the people that were there before in Yoruba. Right. Some people were scattered Their Your forefathers were scattered in Yoruba. And the reason why I can say that with confidence is because of your genetic distance value. Right. Your genetic distance value. When we look at the tribes as a whole. And basically, like I said, a genetic distance value shows you how closely related you are to it, like which tribe. In Africa, are you you the most closely related to? So if you were from Yoruba, when we run your genetic distance value, then you, the tribe of Yoruba should be your closest tribe. If you ran your AfricanAncestry.com and it said that, hey, you match your one of your forefathers on your Y DNA side is from uh, uh, Angola. When we run your genetic distance value, then the tribe in Angola should be your closest match. But what people are finding out is that when they take a look at their genetic distance value and they look at look at it at a at a tribe level, none of the none of the tribes on the West Coast of Africa are your closest match. Your closest match are the people way on the south south side of Africa that just got there from Yemen. Right. That have a that have a lineage or a history of coming out of Babylon. Like that's your closest match. Right. So that should show you who you are and where you come from. But again, let me come back to this, this reference in this reference. So this reference is just showing you, family, that we had fled into Africa before. This is a fling back into Africa. This is in the we did it in four. You see the dates on the screen, family. You see 14662, 1342, 1350, 1403. It says or else such as came out of Europe whence they were banished out of the parts of Italy in the year 1342, out of Spain in the year 1462. Out of the Low Country in 1350, out of France in 1403, out of England 1444. All these dates, family. All these dates are uh, are dates in which our people fled back into Africa. Right. All these dates are dates in which our people fled back into Africa. And so you know the transatlantic slave trade as well as I do. What do you think happened after they fled back in Africa? And knock, 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 them curses showed up. <laughs> what do you think happened, family? You know what happened. Uh, curses showed up, then stuck them on the ship and sent them back out. <laughs> so, you, uh, so like I said, family, if you think you're going to run away from these curses, you got another thing coming, family. Because knock, 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 when you go over to Africa and you're around a bunch of folks that look like you, guess what's going to happen? But you know that better, better than I do. Hallelujah. But look, uh, I, I just put this one in here, family, just to show you that the Israelites from Spain and Portugal, according to those old. Uh, but that uh, the Israelites of Spain and Portugal were uh, people of color, are people of color. Right. This is the reason why I'm showing this to you, just to kind of touch on it before we uh, as we go through the lesson here. And it says 
Uh, King John in 1492 expelled all the Jews to the island of St. Thomas, which had been discovered in the year 1471 in other Portuguese settlements on the continent of Africa. And from these banished Jews, the black Portuguese, remember the, the uh, Portuguese word for black was and is Negro. So the Negro Portuguese, as they were called, so they were actually called Negro Portuguese, as they were called, and the Jews of Luango, who were despised even by the very Negroes, are descended. Right. So just wanted to show you that they were called black, they were called Negroes in Spain and Portugal. And this is what I was I was referring to before, as far as like, you know, is you know, we Israelites, we you know, we come from all different walks. Uh, all different beliefs, you know, um, and just like when you go to work family and you have to do your day to day uh, jobs at work. Some of you might be working alongside a racist. Some of you might be working alongside of, of rednecks that used to string up black folks. Some of you some of you all might be working, working alongside Christians. Right. Some of you might be working alongside Muslims. You might be working alongside people of all these different faiths. You do it from nine to five, five days a week. You know, however many uh, months a year you do it, you do it right. You know, they got a different uh, opinion. You know, they have a different view, but you set all that aside and you get the job done and you get your paycheck at the end of the day. You know, say all that to say that in this walk of Israel, you know, same thing here, family. You know, we have people with different understandings, different beliefs, but. You know, we have a greater enemy here, you know, especially here in the States that we all need to work together to handle, you know, to defend against, to um, to guard against. Right. And these, you know, these differences that we have, we need to set them aside, family. And I can tell you that this division is what caused and it was part of the reason why, uh, you know, the you know, these quote unquote Arabs were able to gather our people from the places into which that we were living in Africa at the time, I have to stress that we were living in Africa at the time, that our people, that those people, the enemies of Israel were, were able to go into these massive population centers of Israelites. Like there were literally population centers in Africa of Israelite, commun whole Israelite communities where a few uh, Arabs were able to go in and take and rob Israelites. Put them on slave ships and ship, ship and ship them around around the world. And the reason why they were able to do that, and you can actually see uh, the reason why and read about it in the same books where the actually the uh, the Arabs that were going into these communities, like they they commented, they, they say that that it's like, man, if these people ever woke up and bought and banded together, it's like, man, we would be we would be done for. But thank goodness they're divided. Thank goodness they're you know they're against each other. Thank goodness that when they go and attack and rob a, a, a neighbor and take that neighbor stuff and, you know, and enslave that neighbor. Thank goodness that the four or five neighbors down the street don't rise up and attack us. Whew, thank goodness that they just sit back and, and let it happen. That's how we were family. And that's how our demise came to being in Africa. Right. So like I said, the reason why I say that is that is that, you know, I know that a lot of us think we have different beliefs, you know, especially like when, we, when it comes to you know where Africa is. You know, I told you at the beginning of, of the uh, of the lesson, you know, where, you know, the Benai Israel channel is on, on some of these things. But it's not a deal breaker family. That's just what I what I believe. And I gave you the reason why I believe it. And if you think differently, that's fine. That's going to be on you. If you think Africa is going to be in a different place. Fine. What, <clears throat> what's what's going to happen in my mind? We gonna get back over to the conf over over to the con continent. We gonna embrace. We gonna fist bump, man hug, and you gonna go your way. I'm gonna go my way. That's what's gonna happen. <laughs> so it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal while we're here over in the daughter of Babylon, and Babylon's making schemes and plans to come against us. And we need to be doing the same thing that when our forefathers came out of Babylon and they were trying to rebuild the walls, they had their sword in their hands trying to build the walls up. That's the only thing that matters right now. Sword in your hand, build the walls up. Sword in the hand, build the walls up. Right. That's the only thing that's that we're kind of worried about right now or trying to get done right now. All right. All right. Well, let me try to advance through some of these slides, family. Like I said, I, I put some of these slides in here just to show you. Uh, I, I think this was I meant to have these um, references in here just to show you 
about you know why the B'nai Israel channel believes about the um, you know uh, Israel being where it is. You can you can check it out on your own. I got a uh, a lesson out there. I think it's called like Ten Toes Down or something like that. Uh, just check it out. I go over I go over the um, the boundaries. If you're interested, uh, if not, that's fine. Like I said, we going most high willing. We get over there. We are gonna fist bump, man, man hug. You gonna go your way. I'm gonna go my way. But the question comes back around, family. Should we stay or should we go? Should we stay or should we go? So I'm gonna try to see if I can do a. I know you. You know, if you ever done any of these um, presentations before, you know some of the things you, you know, you don't necessarily want to do is try to do a uh, uh, something on the fly. But I'm gonna try to do something on the fly. I'm gonna try to do a poll. Let's say start a poll. Ask your question. It says, "Should we? Should we flee to Africa?" question mark and i'll say if so when question mark and then what i'll say is flee now flee during per or right. uh, flee during the judgment of Babylon, and hopefully I'm spelling this right. Uh, oh goodness! And Babylon, and we added flee after Babylon is judged. Okay, so let's see, must contain, there we go. All right, so create poll, let's see. All right, so let's see, hopefully you're able to see the, um, are you all able to see the poll family? If so, um, oops, I got a typo in there. Yep, yep. I I agree, family. I, I see folks saying I'm I'm ready to to flee this place. I am too. I am too. Trust me. I'm ready to get up get up out of here. Uh. So hopefully that poll shows up, family. Like like I said, I'm just kind of doing this on the fly. Um. And let me go back into the chat here to see if i can see the poll that i just put out hang on yeah apologize family like i said i'm just trying to do this on the fly try to get a a um yeah well i don't see the poll so i might i might be doing something wrong but oh, let me go back up to the top at the top nope all right well, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. So poll, create poll, start poll. All right. All right. So that's that. So you have to figure out, like I said, family, the, the question on the floor is family. Do we flee now? Do we flee later, like when um, Babylon is being judged, or do we or do we flee afterwards? Those are the three questions on the floor. Do we flee now? Do we flee later, or do we flee, do we flee during the time that Babylon's being judged, or do we flee later? So, just want to get your thoughts and opinions on that. All right. And while you're thinking about that, family, for those of you all who believe in the, the 400 year uh, prophecy. Uh, here is Genesis 15, uh, verse 14. And let's read it, family. It says, uh, actually, let's start with 13. It says, and he said unto Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land 
Oh, let me make sure my audio is good. Okay, there we go. That die, she, that die, let me start over. It says, verse 13, and he said unto Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they serve will I judge. And then it says, family, and afterwards, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. So, and if you take a look at that word afterwards, because sometimes, you know, um, when you're reading stuff in Egypt, I'm sorry, when you're reading stuff, not in Egypt, when you're reading stuff in English, um, you know, it does help to go and take a look at the Hebrew uh, words, right? And so we took a look at it. So that word afterwards is Strong's number H310. It's the Hebrew word Ashar, if I'm pronouncing it, uh, Akar, Akar. I think that's the, uh, the way it sounds, Akar, right? And it literally means like after that again, at, away from, back from behind, uh, beside, by, right? So if, you know, depending on like this, you look at these uh, definitions of the word a car, it seems like, it seems like family, based off of the 400 year prophecy that after the judgment, we will be leaving, right? After the judgment, we will be leaving. But like I said, you know, everyone, you know, believes differently. That's fine. Uh, but it's interesting to take a look to see the, that scripture in verse. Or because, you know, you might say, well, Brother Benaiah, doesn't it doesn't the scriptures talk about, you know, flee from Babylon? Um, and actually, I think this is one of the ones like we take a look at Zechariah two, verse six. And just real quick before I read this one, family. Yes, it actually talks about fleeing from Babylon. But the question, like I said, family, is when. It's not if. The question isn't if, it's when. And it says, Zechariah chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the, the, the land of the north, says Yahuwah. For I have spread you abroad as four winds of the heaven, says Yahuwah. Oh, let me go back. It says, deliver thyself, O Zion. So that points to a self deliverance right right i mean just in i guess if we look at the examples that we've had in the scriptures when israel has come out of captivity one being egypt like when israel left out of egypt it wasn't like they were floating on clouds they were literally walking with their cattle right or when israel came out of the babylonian captivity they weren't floating on on clouds they were walking out of babylon so they were delivering themselves right but it says Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwelleth with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says Yahuwah of hosts, after, that's that same word, Akar, the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which have spoiled you. Then it says, for he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. For behold, I will shake my hand upon them. That points to judgment, right? Then it says, and they shall be spoiled to their servants. So that looks like the servants will be taken as spoiled. It says, and you shall know that Yahuwah has sent me, that you, Yahuwah of hosts has sent me. All right. So that's, you know, like I said, that's something to keep in mind. And that's, this is the reason why, you know, the Benai Israel channel takes the stance that we do. I, I think that uh, when it comes to when, you know, I'm of the, of the belief that we will be called away and out of this land after Babylon gets judged. That's just, that's my beliefs. Like I said, some folks believe differently. That's fine. Uh, but before you go, let me just send you, <laughs> share some information with you about what to look out for you uh, while you're in the continent. And same for, you know, for those of us most high willing, if we're able to get on those ships to Tarshish and make it back over to, um, uh, you know, the uh, Africa, the continent, you know, there are certain things that we have to kind of reprogram our mind to when we get over there, because, We've been so whitewashed over here in the States that that our enemies, that our persecutors have a certain look that when we get over on the continent, you know, we kind of let our guard down. And the point of this uh, live and this lesson is to show you that you probably shouldn't do that. You know, uh, but let's keep going, family. And it says outstretched arms and with fury poured out. OK, I think I put this in here just to show that when uh, the Most High gathers us. 
It would be during a time when uh, with the mighty hand, with outstretched arms, with your pull out. All right. Um, and let's see, trouble at home. And this is, you know, the purpose of this, these slides in here, family, is just to show you that, you know, we are getting persecuted here, here at home. You know, like I said, those curses be showing up, family. <laughs> those, those curses showed up here in the States. We, we can we can say that for sure. You know, where you talk about slavery, we talk about them Jim Crows, you talked about the persecution by the police. Um, you know, we over here in the States, we can attest to being persecuted, right? And it says, uh, just, you know, just to kind of read it, I mean, we've read it many times. I know you probably read this many times, but this one more time, family, it says, Deuteronomy 28, verse 45, it says, moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of Yahuwah, thy Elohim, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded thee. All right. So just wanted to show you that those curses were coming regardless. All right. And, you know, like I said, put this in here just to show you some of the, you know, when the persecutions kicked off in different places, especially over in Europe, right, that, you know, it was a doctrine of flee. Like persecution kicked off, we fled. Persecution kicked off, we fled. Persecution kicked off, we fled. <laughs> Spain and Portugal, or Spain, 1492. Persecution kicked off, we fled. Uh, Portugal, 1497. Persecution kicked off, we fled. So that's the that's our pattern family like that's what we do so you know i'm not that's why i'm like i'm not surprised that we want to leave this place because why we've done it over and over and over <laughs> and over again you know uh because at the end of the day family we just want peace we just want shalom i understand you understand family we just want shalom right but the only way for us to get that shalom family is to turn back to the most high yah that's the way that we're going to get back shalom. And, you know, this is kind of where we get into, you know, all right, so we're back over in Africa, you know, whether it's before, during, or after uh, the judgment of the daughter of Babylon, regardless of when it occurs, you get back over in Africa, there's a few things you, you know, we should know as Israelites. You know, we should know that you know, during the, the course of the Old Testament that, you know, we know that Israel was split up between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. We know that the northern kingdom often went by the, the name of Ephraim and the southern kingdom went by the often went by the name of Judah. And the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom uh, were at such odds that they had wars against each other. Like the northern kingdom literally tried to replace the ruling lineage of judah with the with the lineage from ephraim like that's how serious it got right and this is kind of just touches on it a little bit where it says in isaiah verse 9 verse 20 words where it says manasseh ephraim and ephraim and manasseh and together shall be against judah for all this his anger anger is not turned away but his hand is stretched out still it's talking about the most high's hand so you know in throughout the scriptures, Ephraim and Judah had beefs, right? They had beef all throughout the scripture. It, and guess what, family? By the time you get over to the New Testament, that beef was still in place, <laughs> right? That beef was still in place. And so the reason why I, I bring that up uh, in a, is that that beef is going to be in place until some, you know, until this this part right here let's say is this is isaiah chapter 11 verse 13 actually i'm going to start at verse 11 and read down it says and it shall come to pass in that day that yahuwah shall set his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people which are left and this is interesting from ashar from egypt so there's, there's gonna be some of our people in egypt from pathros there's gonna be some of our people in pathros and from kush there's gonna be some of our people in kush so that's why i'm not i'm not uh against people going to the lands of Cush because according to the, the scriptures people are going to be collected from Cush and it says and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the Isles of the sea right so that goes for everybody else that's still out that will be out in these Isles of the sea and it says and he shall set up an ensign from the nations 
and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather to get, gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And it says, this is key, fam. It says, the envy also of Ephraim shall depart. Like that thing has to go. For you to have shalom with Ephraim, the envy of Ephraim got to go. It says, the envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. It says, Ephraim shall not envy Judah and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. And then let's see what happens next. It says, but uh, verse 14, but they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines towards the west and they shall spoil them of the east together and they shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Hallelujah. So you see, family, there's a beef between Ephraim and Judah that has to occur uh, even for you to live in peace with Ephraim. <laughs> Because let's say, for instance, family, you move someplace and you're moving into Ephraim's city or town and his and his envy hasn't departed. And you don't know that you're vexing Ephraim. You're going to be in for a long, long stay over on the continent. And let's see here. So proof and just to, just to give you an example of how the the persecution of Ephraim was there all along, like how Ephraim was an enemy of Judah all along right uh ever since you've seen that beef in the old testament it even carried over to, over into spain and portugal and like i was telling you earlier family like sometimes when you're you're studying this stuff family you come across information and you try not to go down a rabbit rabbit hole and you try to just stay focused on the topic at, at hand and so what i do is I'll, i take that information and i kind of set it aside um and this is one of the one of those pieces of information that i came across and that is i we came across the persecution of Israel in Spain and Portugal. Like I said, in Spain and Portugal, Israel, you know, they, they were having a good time. They were living in peace and shalom. All the Israelites from all over came to Spain and, Spain and Portugal because everything was good. But guess who was one of the enemies that was working with uh, the, the uh, Spanish and Portuguese monarchs the, of, of uh, you know, the Caucasians, right? Guess who was working with them to come against you in Spain and Portugal, right? So let's talk about uh, Ben Zamero. And you may not be familiar with this name, but this is Ben Zamero. This is someone of Ephraim descent in Spain and Portugal. Ephraim descent. Uh, ben Zamero. I think that's the, how you pronounce it. So let's read about Ben Zamero of Ephraim in Spain and Portugal. Let's see what he did to the uh, descendants of King David in Spain and Portugal. It reads, Ben Zamero, Spanish Moroccan family, its best known members in Spain live chiefly in Seville, which is the same place that Judah was in, right? It says, Judah ben Ephraim, Moses and his son Ephraim were 14th century financers in Solomon the Mir. It says Isaac settled in uh, Badajoz, I know I'm messing that name up, Spain, where shortly before the 1492 expulsion, Ferdinand and Isabel intervened to, to ensure that the sums he had advanced them for the war against Granada would be repaid. So basically, family, Ephraim was paying Ferdinand and Isabel to come against you in your peace and shalom in Spain and Portugal. He was paying them. And what this is saying is that Ferdinand and Isabel wanted to make sure that he would get his money back, that he would get repaid. This is Ephraim doing what Ephraim was doing in the Old Testament. He's doing it in Spain and Portugal. And guess what? Ephraim is black. <laughs> Ephraim is black. So if you're whitewashed, you know, like I said, you get all whitewashed here in the States, you move over to Spain and Portugal, or you move over to Africa next to them Ephraimites who was just paying to get your, your forefathers uh, killed and, and persecuted or unalived and persecuted over in Spain and Portugal. And now they're down in Africa and, and we're just so caught up on this. Hey, as long as they're black, I'm good. You're going to have a problem. 
But let's keep reading, fam. It says, Ferdinand and, and Isabel intervened to ensure that the large sums of money he had advanced them for the war against Granada. Remember, Granada was the town of the Jews. Granada was the town of the Israelites. Granada was a town of the sons of King David. But here's Ephraim paying Ferdinand and, Is and Isabella to come against Granada. And it says, he was probably the same Isaac Benzamero, who after 1496, listen fam, then he settled in Safi, 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 Morocco. So basically, when, when uh, Judah fled from Spain and Portugal into Northern Africa, into Morocco, guess who else came into there? Here come Ephraim following after you. I'm telling you, family, if you think you're running to, and you're going to get away from these uh, curses, them curses, be, they just be showing up, family. Like the most high's word is going to come to pass. When it says that those curses are, go are going to pursue you and overtake you, it's coming in the form of a person, of a people, right? And you can see it when you look through history. So it says, yeah, and I see, um, and eventually, yeah, eventually Ephraim will come back over to our side, family. Uh, we will become one stick, right? Instead of right now, we're two sticks, but there will come a time when uh, we will become one stick, one family, one Israel, and then we're going to fly and, and and lay some hands on some folks. But uh, but we're not there yet. <laughs> we're not there yet. But it says, look, it says, and he probably the same Isaac Benzamero, who after 1496 settled in Safa, Safi, which is Morocco, he became the treasurer of the Portuguese governors there exercising important political influence and was entrusted with him uh, many dipl diplomatic missions, both the king in Lisbon and to the Moroccan leaders. So I had multiple I have multiple uh, references on this and I actually owe you at least another reference on this. But in some of the other references, family, what it, what it, what it says is that the what what King Isabel, I'm sorry, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel did was that when the Jews when the Yehudi, when the Israelites fled over to Spain and Portugal, they sent Ephraim over there and they put Ephraim in charge. Like Ephraim was the was the ruling in Morocco on behalf of Ferdinand and Isabella. And guess what? We got persecuted over in Morocco and we fled deeper <laughs> into Africa across the, across the Sahara. Running away from Ephraim, right? Running away from black Ephraim. And just to show you that in Morocco, and one of the places in Morocco is called Ephraim, Ophram. It says the, the principal capital of Central Sud region, North Central Morocco, is situated in the middle Atlas Mountains. And I'm going to skip down where it says the Jews of this kingdom are said to have belonged to the tribe of Ephraim. To the tribe of Ephraim. So where we got persecuted? Ephraim was there. Ephraim was put in charge. He was working with the people that had just kicked us out of Spain and Portugal. So again, Ephraim is black. <laughs> so one of the, if you're taking notes, family, you might want to look out for Ephraim because you also find Ephraim on old maps. You'll see that where I, the part that I have highlighted, and I believe this is this is a map from John Ogilvy's book, but you'll see that it says Old Benai Ephraim, or it says Benai Ephraim, which means the sons of Ephraim. So if you, it's funny because family, if you look at this map and you see the sons of Ephraim and you get excited, you're like, oh man, well, well, Ephraim is a, Ephraim is an Israelite tribe. I mean, yeah, I mean, all right. We, so we were there on the, on the uh, coast of Africa. And if you see that and you don't know the history, you know, you'll think, you'll think wrongly about what's going on. You have to understand that at this time, this is just after Ephraim just got finished kicking out or helping pay the uh, Isabel and Ferdinand, pay them to kick out Judah from Spain and Portugal. This is just after, after Judah fled into Morocco, Ephraim was over our people in Morocco and Ephraim was persecuting them in Morocco. Then, you know, the transatlantic slave trade kicks out. And the place that was called the, the slave coast, where our people were captured, shipped, and, and, and uh, put in those, those slave ships and, and shipped across the ocean, 
you got the sons of Ephraim right there. What do you think the sons of Ephraim were doing? <laughs> That's what I'm saying, family. It's like you might want to be careful. You might want to look out for the folks that go by the name of Ephraim over in Africa. So because they look like you, because, you know, I can't say that they talk like you, but because they, they look like you, you might want to pay attention to the names, family. Pay attention to the names because the enemies of Israel, I guess you can see where I'm going. They are there, too. Right. Even the homie, like people will tell you, like the homie are, is the home of Dan. Well, what was Dan to Israel in the Bible? What was Dan in Israel to the Bible, the tribe of Dan in Israel to the Bible? It says here, it says Genesis chapter 49, verse Let's read. Let's start over verse 16. It says Genesis chapter 49, verse 16. It says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way. An adder, which is a poisonous snake, snake, if I remember, it says in the path that biteth the horse's heels so that his rider shall fall backwards. So you can see that Dan is a serpent. <laughs> Dan equals snake. I see somebody, uh, light warrior. Dan equals snake. So you might want to look out for Dan while you're over there, right? And Dan is black, right? But guess who else is over there? The people of Ashkenaz are over in Africa. And of course, if you know, you know that they were over in Africa, you know, they definitely know that they're in South Africa, you know, that uh, South African, uh, what is it called? Jewish Board of Directors. Uh, they were trying to come against uh, Brother Ron's film to, to get it banned and uh, make it make it against the law to be seen over over in Africa. So we know that they were there. In fact, you know, some people were surprised to learn that they've been there in that particular region, in that particular town since the 1800s. Right. Since the 1800s. Fam. So they've been there a long time, a long time. So, again, you leave from over here because we know that, you know, we know that. Uh, Descendants of Ashkenaz are, are over here in the States as well. But just so that you know that you aren't getting away from Ashkenaz if you go over to you know certain parts of Africa. And just to show you this uh, here, family, I'm actually going to start off with the, the creation of the Anti-Defamation League. What you're looking at, family, is the creation of the eight, what, you know, what folk, folks call the, the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. And let's see how they were formed. Right. Who formed them? And then we're going to see where these people who formed them, where they're operating out of. So this says this is talking about the formation of the Anti-Defamation League. And I'm going to stick to the highlighted text where it says prominent local Jews, members of the national organization. It says Anti-Defamation League with executive offices in Chicago and member and represented in Washington by a number of members of Congress and citizens. So basically, family, when they were created, they were created by representatives in Congress. Representatives in Congress. The Washington members are representatives, and it kind of just lists the names, right? And those are the names, and it says the, the Anti-Defamation League was founded under the auspices or the direction of the Independent Order of Benai Brith. And family, we're going to go into this organization at some point, uh, most high willing. But the reason why it says, why it reads like this, why it says Independent Order of Benai Brith, that's because they are a fraternal order. They are a fraternal order. You know, all this talk about Masons and stuff like that. Oh, there's some Masons that you need to worry about. You know, don't get me wrong, family. You know, there's some definitely some masons you need to worry about. And it's not the ones that, you know, that po folks around here talking about some made up hand signs and stuff like that. This is this isn't that this is the organization that has had its hands in the, in the demise of so-called Negroes all around the world, especially specifically here in the States. And you need to know that it is a fraternal order. And most like I said, most high willing, we will go into that. But I'm going to skip this slide. And what I'm going to do, family, let's see, it says. It says like the Anti-Defamation League, I'm, I'm at the bottom here where it says uh, the Anti-Defamation League, which was organized, organized in Chicago by members of the Benai Brith Fraternal Org Organization. I'm, I inserted that has spread throughout the country. 
So the purpose of me showing you this, families, is I just want to show you that the Anti-Defamation League was organized by members of the Benai Breath Fraternal Order. These, mace, these Jewish Masons, so to speak, created the Anti-Defamation League. Right. So the Benai Breath organization created the Anti-Defamation League. So with that being said, family, let's take a look at where the Benai Breath organization is operating out of. Now, I know this this uh, picture is grainy. I couldn't get a better picture of this family. I apologize. But if you take a look, this, these are the locations of where the Benai Breath organization is operating out of. And you'll see some, I have some, um, I have some locations highlighted over to the right, over in Africa. So this is the organization. So keep in mind, this is the organization that created the Anti-Defamation League. And you'll notice they have offices near the slave coast, where a lot of the slaves for the transatlantic slave trade were taken from. You'll notice that they have offices over in Congo, where the majority, if I remember correctly, the majority of slaves from the transatlantic slave trade came from. And you'll notice that they, they have offices in South Africa. And this is where, you know, some of our brothers and sisters are looking to move, move to. But just want to show you, family, that they have been operating in Africa. And strangely enough, they are operating in places are operated and operating in places where we were sold as slaves. Think about let that, let that sink in family. They were operating this, this fraternal order was operating in places where we were sold as slaves. Mm. So that's, speaks to so those slides speak to the benai brith organization and where where they are in africa right so uh and then this particular slide that we're looking at has to do with um haplo group now we're talking now we're going to talk about dna right in dna we're talking about group r1b right r1b and you know that parts of r1b originated in the caucasus mountains originated in the Caucasus Mountains. And we also know that R1B, they were the ones that actually carried light skin over into places like Europe. And we also know that uh, portions of R1B, uh, that especially in you know Ukraine, uh, in Crimea, that area is where blue eyes came from. Like all the, all the people that have, that have blue eyes, you know, came from this, region of uh of the Khazars of you know the northern Caucasus right and that's where you see a good portion of the R1B lineage come from well the reason why I'm showing you this family is that as you can see like in Africa you'll see this big blob <laughs> of of R1B in Africa right you'll see this big blob of R1B in Africa, actually all, all the way, even in um, uh, Nigeria as well. And guess what? They're not white in Africa. They're black in Africa. And you might be thinking, well, who is R1B? Right. This is where I showed you in some of the previous videos that R1B is a is a, a, a combination of two people primarily. R1B is a combination of the people of biblical Ashkenaz. And R1B is, a, is also a combination of biblical Gog and Magog. So those two people, you know, in my opinion, are what makes up R1B. And the reason why I show you that, the reason why I say that is because what I use, I use two things. I use the haplogroup uh, maps that show where uh, certain uh, haplogroups come from. And then I map that up or match that up to with the uh, the uh, table of nations map. So when you look at the haplogroup map and the map says R1B comes from like the territory of Romania, Georgia. And when you look to see biblically what those areas were called, 
uh, based off of the Table of Nations, based off of the Table of Nations, though that territory is biblical Ashkenaz, right? Biblical Ashkenaz. So that's that's why. So the point here, the point here, family, is that in Africa, you potentially have Gog, Magog, and biblical Ashkenaz all up in Nigeria, Chad, southern uh, southern uh, Udan, all right here. And this isn't the, the only place that that they're uh, that they're at. And as I said before, they are black. They look like you. They look like you and I. They have uh, woolly hair. Right, dark skin. Some of them, some of them even have blue eyes. Like to me, you know, I've gotten to the point where I say that blue eyes is a giveaway for the Neanderthal gene, and the Neanderthal gene uh, traces all the way back to the Caucasus. So back when you know we were thinking that blue eyes was a novelty, it was something to, um, you know, you see a, you see it a lot in Hollywood, like in a lot of these Hollywood pictures and these actors and stuff. They tend to if you if you kind of just pay attention, like the next time you go and take a look at movies, you'll see that a lot of the actors have blue eyes. And, you know, what we've proven according to DNA, you know, we we read the DNA reports that shows you that blue eyes comes from. I think I actually have it here in the slide. But blue eyes actually comes from uh, the Caucasus Mountains. It comes from Neanderthals. And this is another article where someone's saying. Some have also suggested that blue eyes are a result of ancient interbreeding with Neanderthals who have went into extinction, extinction about uh, 25,000 years ago. So just to show you that, that it's been reported. It's been, you know, they, they've looked, they did the analysis. They took a look at the mutation, the, the genetic mutation that causes blue eyes in humans. And then they took a look at the genetic mutation that causes that caused blue eyes in Neanderthals. And they said, when they took a look at it, they said, wait a minute, this mutation looks almost identical. And they were saying that so much so that the only difference between these two mutations is 10, I think they were saying like, like 10 places in the genes are in this mutation where they're different, which meant that one mutation came from the other. And what they were thinking was that the, the homo sapien mutation came from the Neanderthal. Like that's why they were saying that they're related. Like you don't get uh, mutations that close, right? And they not be and they not be related. Like they are related. So that's why people can say with confidence that blue eyes, yep, that comes from Neanderthal because of that mutation is almost identical to the one that they found in Neanderthals. And not only that, we can use that to then track, you know, uh, people that have this mutation because we know where that mutation first got inserted into the, into the homo sapien genome that occurred in Ukraine that occurred in uh, the place around the Caucasus mountains. And in here, you can see where it says, when we're talking about R1B, it says uh, evidence of blue eyed Africans also abounds throughout Africa, including South Sudan, South Africa, Nigeria, Uganda, and more. So again, this, you know, this is one of those traits where uh, we can say for sure that came from the Caucasus Mountains, right? Came from the Caucasus Mountains. And like I said, R1B is, you know, if, if you use the genetic origins map in conjunction with the 10, uh, um, the, tab the table of nations, uh, those people are biblical Ashkenaz and biblical um, Gog and Magog. All up in Africa, looking like you. All right. So here's uh, just kind of put this in here just to sh uh, just to show you that you know what I'm telling you is what was written. You know that all blue-eyed people can uh, can be traced back to one ancestor who lived ten thousand years ago near the Black Sea. And if you read some other ones, they'll tell you exactly where that place near the Black Sea was in Ukraine, <laughs> in Ukraine. And then the reason why I can tell you with a surety that that little, remember that little blob that I showed you in Africa? Uh, let me back up here. Uh, this right here, family, like this blob right here in, in Africa. The reason why we know that this is related to the people of the Caucasus has to do with uh, this map. Philemon, 
phalange geni of phylogeny of R1B. So you have R1B1A, and as you can see, the V88 version of the R1B1A, which is that blob in Africa, you see where it says Levant in Africa? That's where it comes from. R1B1A, let's take a look. And you, so, so basically, family, get this in your mind, that, that blob that you saw in Africa comes from R1B1A. Where does R1B1A come from? You can see, you might, I know it's hard to see on this map, but off to the right, right underneath the Caucasus in the territory of biblical Ashkenaz, it says R1B1A. And you see where it says V88, and that's that branch that goes into Africa and settles in Nigeria. So that's biblical Ashkenaz, biblical uh, Gog and Magog in Africa. Looking, looks, looking like us, family, looking like us. Right. And so, and this is something that it was a revelation that actually came to me late, family. You, you remember how, uh, how for the longest for black folks, they kept trying, kept trying to tell black folks like, hey, you know, black folks, you are, you are our cursed people. You know, black folks, uh, it's because of the, the, the curse of Canaan. The curse of Canaan is upon you. That's why, you know, you guys are slaves and you can't really, you know, you're always the tail and not the head, you're, you're below and not above. Like, that's why. That's because of the, the curses of Ham. But family, when you think about it, Canaan is in Israel. <laughs> Literally, they were telling you where you were from. Like, you know, of course, like I said, you know, of course, we all believe different where Israel is. But I just want to show you that when they were saying that we had the curse of Cain on us. Well, with a place where Cain, Canaan came from. Was in this place that they call the Middle East. That's what I mean, they were literally kind of telling you where we were from. This, this stuff was going over our head because we didn't really know where they where they said Canaan was. Right. So I just want to point that out to you. I was like, man, this. They were telling us that we were the people all along and we didn't, didn't even know it. So, again, like I said, I know we believe this, believe differently. That's fine. Like I said, we get over to Africa. We're going we gonna to man hug, fist bump. You know, I'm going to wish you well. Y'all going to wish me well. We're going to go about our business. No uh, skin off nobody's back. Not a big deal. Right. Not a big deal. Fam. But I what I do want to show you that is that Ashkenaz, you'll see Ashkenaz at the top middle. Right. That's the area where R1B1A uh, originates from, from biblical Ashkenaz, right? And you'll see Gog and Mag or Magog off to the left. But what happens, what happens, family, is that over time, you'll see Magog transition from the left up to above Ashkenaz, right? Above the, you know, the place where Ashkenaz came from. So uh, Magog in ends up uh, being in the Northern Caucasus Mountains, as well as Ashkenaz. You also see Ashkenaz kind of go up, above the Caucasus mountains, depending on the, um, uh, depending on the, which, you know, whichever map you're looking at at the time. So that's that. So, all right. So, so far family, you know, I've showed you that, that Ephraim, you know, he did play a part in our demise in Spain and Portugal over in Morocco, also on the West coast of Africa. Well, at least showed you that, you know, on the slave coast, you can find Ephraim and that's right after he had just finished persecuting us over in Morocco, just finished persecuting us over in um, Spain and Port Portugal by paying uh, King King Ferdinand and Isabel to come against us, to war against us, to, to destroy us, right? And then I also showed you that, you know, of course, uh, R1B is in the heart of Africa and also showed you that Ashkenaz is in Africa, that when you, we take a look at, the, at that organization, that fraternal Masonic organization, Benai Brith, that they had offices in the places where we were being persecuted. They had <laughs> they had offices in the places that we were getting sold as slaves, right? So, uh, and you know, and a lot of a lot of these a lot of these people look just like you and me. So, again, just throwing caution caution out there, family. That when you go over to the continent, whether you, whether you go before the persecution, during the persecution. Or after the the uh, judgment of Babylon, whatever. When you get over there, family, these are the things you definitely want to keep in mind, right? Because there are going to be a whole bunch of people that look like you, and you may want to start asking, "Hey, what, what's your name again?" <laughs> no, no, no. Your last, your your, uh, your 
yeah, your, your um, traditional name. Yeah, they, they, tell, tell me that. Yeah. But in addition to those to those <clears throat> those people, and we know that JFAT and friends are out in man, in force in Africa. We all, all know about how Europe is trying to carve up Africa, trying to, uh, you know, trying to make uh, create a footprint over in Africa. And I know some of our brothers and sisters have, have brought this out, but I'm just going to bring some bring uh, revisit some of these references. But you may not you may or may not have heard of AFRICOM. AFRICOM. So AFRICOM, it says a formerly secret map of AFRICOM shows. So uh, AFRICOM is the U.S. setting up bases in Africa. The U.S.'s bases in Africa were called AFRICOM. So think about it, family. It's like, man, you you tired of the U.S. You tired of the you know what I what I call the daughter of Babylon. Man, you get on the boat, a boat, plane you know, a ship, you get on a plane and ship, you come all the way over here and then you go around the corner, man, you get among your people, you're all happy, you go around the corner and you see a U.S. flag flying. <laughs> like, man, what's what's going on? Who, who are these people? And they're working with the government. And if they're uh, working against you over in the U.S., what do you think they're going to be doing to you over in the continent? I mean, come on, fam. So, in AFRICOM, let's check out some of the uh, the information about AFRICOM. It's called the U.S. Africa Command, right? Oops, clicked on one too many buttons here. U.S. African Africa Command. This is the U.S. Department of Defense. So this thing is real, family. They are there. They got bases there, right? And you can see, check it out. People on the right that looks just like you and I. People on the left. Looks just like you and I, right? And we have a European in the middle training the brothers on the right and the brothers on the left. <laughs> so guess what? You go to Africa, you uh, gonna meet some people that look like the brothers on the, on the right, not knowing that they working with AFRICOM. That's what I'm saying, family. And so it's not just the tribes that you have to look out for, it's these um, these other nations that are training family. They're literally training the native populations family over in Africa. So that's another thing to look out for. And this is this is like a map of some of the uh, <clears throat> of the Africom places, also native or NATO NATO bases in Africa as well. You can see that they are in many places, and actually. The places where they are kind of changes, you know, based on, you know, which map you're looking at. And also, you know, you heard about Russia trying to get bases <clears throat> in Africa as well. You know, these are the places where Russia or the Wagner group has a footprint in Russia. Right. The Wagner group has a footprint in Russia. I'm sorry. I said in Russia, in Africa. Sorry about that, fam. In Africa, the Wagner group. Who's you know Russian Wagner Group has a footprint in Africa. That's what I meant to say. So again, you know, you're in Africa, you're among your people. You'll go around the corner, like, whoo, man, I made it up, made it amongst my people. You go around the corner, you see a a Russian flag flying. What's up with that? Or maybe that maybe they they won't even have a Russian flag. Maybe they just train the natives into their and and indoctrin, indoctrinate them into their philosophy and their beliefs and their hatred for you. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, we're gonna give you this money. But by the way, there's these people that just got there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those people. Oh, they no good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You might want to put them into some some camps or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah just just uh, make sure you, you you oppress them and do all this that that stuff to you. And if you do that to do that to them, you know, maybe we, we'll give you some money. You know, who knows what they're telling them, family? Who knows? But you know, nine times out of ten, we know it's not good. So what we're doing, family, was that we're just going through some of these different bases in Africa. You can see a bunch of them over, you know, in northern, western, central Africa, right? So like I said, depending on which map you look at, I mean, some, and some of these bases are secret. It's not like they're going to tell you, right? So these are just the ones that, that they know about. And then we can't leave out the Chinese. You know, China is trying to get some military bases. It's like China, they, they do it uh, kind of like... Um, not not so they, they, they do it overtly i'll put it to you that way like they'll try to do their military bases but they'll they'll also you know insert themselves in africa in certain pr in programs 
like, hey, we'll build your roads. Hey, we'll, you know, we'll build your infrastructure. We'll build your, um, you know, your, your facilities, you know, and they'll, they'll bug them. <laughs> they'll, uh, they'll, they'll spy on, use the, uh, those facilities to spy on the African people. But that's a story for another day. But just to show you that China is in Africa as well. And so these are the places like now, these are not China bases. But like I was saying before, China tries to insert themselves through, uh, you know, they try to insert themselves you know, through some, you know, some of these, these plans, like these, these, these uh, efforts and stuff that they, like they have in Africa, these programs, like, Hey, we'll build your infrastructure. Like this was the, the one for electricity. So this is where China has their, their footprint on the electrical, electrical uh, grid. And of course, when they do that, they, they import their own people. Right. And they've carved out a place for their own people in Africa. So it's not like they're just giving the Africans money to do it, it's like no, no, no. We we gonna bring our own people, yeah, yeah. And we gonna need a, a place for a village, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we and we'll we'll police our own village. So it's kind of like a little a little Chinatown in Africa, all around Africa, right? So again, and if you're thinking, well, the Chinese really haven't done anything to uh, the Africans. Well, let me just remind you because you know I know this was a big thing when it came out in the news a while back, but just to sh just to show you that. You know that these foreign, you know, foreign entities don't always have Africa's best interests in mind. And one example of that was with this whole thing about rice. I don't know if you guys remember or not, but at one point in time, uh, there was a a case where China was, you know, selling Africa rice, and it's like you kind of wonder, like, why is Africa importing rice? They got all this fertile land. Can't they, you know, can't, you know? this product be produced in Africa, but that's a story for another day. But anyway, family, they, there was a, a a case where China sent over bags of rice. And when they looked at the rice, tested the rice, they found that it was plastic. Now, of course, they tried to, to deny it. It's like the first people that reported say there was plastic. And then, then the other authorities came after it was like, well, no, no, no they're, they're not plastic. But when you look at the testimony of the people that tried to eat it, they're like, no, nah, it was plastic. <laughs> so check this out, family. This is uh, like I said, CNN. It says plastic or not over 100 bags of fake rice seized in Nigeria. So maybe you want to go to Nigeria and you just want to go around the corner and buy you some some rice. So check this out. It says one customer who avoided a potential mishap was known to ask me to pronounce the name. It says she said she bought 10 cups of the product from a small retailer in Ikaja area of Lagos in November. And she said, this is what she said, family says, it looked perfectly normal and the cost and costless than regular rice. So I thought I got a great deal. Normally it would take 20 minutes to cook, but after 30 minutes, it was still hard. I added more water and the aroma was chemical in nature. So I just, I decided to discard it thinking it had expired. She told CNN. Uh, Skimmy says didn't, uh, and then, of course that person didn't formally report the incident. And it says the one uh, at the at the bottom where it says, in another case, a woman who received rice as a gift noticed something was wrong after cooking it. Her husband then called customs officials. So as you can see, family, and this this is the stuff that came from China. Like so, what you have to think like what. Uh, Benefit would they have in poisoning <laughs> the uh, the African population? You know, just just think about that because you know that Africa is, is ripe with resources. You know, rich with resources, family. So, uh, you know, it kind of makes you wonder. You know, are they trying to pull the same thing that the Europeans did when they came over to America? You know, when you had the Native American Indians and they started giving them blankets with smallpox and and uh warring against them and all that other stuff and literally wiping out the native population is that is that what's going on over in africa you know who knows but the point is family china is there too and china's messing around in africa so like i said if you're thinking about you go over there it's going to be a utopia think again <laughs> and again i'm not, I'm not saying not go because i i do believe at some point in time we are all coming especially those of us that are over here in the states that Either some of us are going to be coming over skipping and some of some people are, are going to come over kicking and screaming because they're going to want to stay in Babylon. But Babylon is going to be a smoke that people are going to be, be able to see from afar off. 
and that it says that no man is going to be there. Like ain't nobody's going to be living over there. Or at least, you know, maybe like six, six feet under, like, you know what I'm saying? Like you don't want to folks, you come in, uh, whether you like it or not. Right. So like I said, the purpose of this video is just to show you some of the things you might want to look out for if you come over before uh, Babylon's judge, during the judgment of Babylon, or after the judge judgment of Babylon. You know, putting putting the ball in your court to do the research and all of this stuff. This is just additional caution, kind of like your your public service announcement. Like, hey, you're going over to Africa. Uh, beware of this. This is this is uh, the purpose of this this video. And like I was saying, like, just because they're black doesn't mean that they're your friends. <laughs> and that goes uh, without saying. I, I saw somebody put in the chat, you know, all skin folk ain't, kin, ain't kinfolk. That is 100. That is 100 percent facts. Right. Even within Israel, because we also know that some Israelites, some uh, blood, blood relatives of Israel are against Israel. So, you know, you just got to be got to be aware of family. Got to be aware. Pray, pray to the Most High for discernment on that, right? And for this family, I'm gonna what I'm gonna show you, family. Uh, now is I'm gonna show you some additional places where Ephraim is, and this is this comes from uh, Sister. Uh, I think it's Dana Donna Reynolds. I can't pronounce her uh, last name, but she's a uh, you know she's a historian. She's a, a, a scholar. And of course, you know, even she thinks differently as far as like where Israel is. She she believes that Israel's over in Yemen, you know, because you know she looks over at Yemen and she sees all these names of tribes of the people that you can find in the Bible over in Yemen. And she says, Whoa, well, if you can find and places, like people and places over in Yemen. So she says, Well, because I can find the people of the Bible over in Yemen, and because I can find the names of places over in Yemen, well, then Yemen is the is the uh, the Holy Land, the motherland. So again, even though I'm playing her uh, video, you know, I don't necessarily agree with the some of the conclusions that she has arrived in, but she has done an outstanding job as far as identifying tribes over in Yemen and over in parts of Africa. So what we're gonna listen to family, we're gonna listen to a uh, video where she's talking about you know, some of the tribes over in Yemen and over in East Africa, right? Over in Africa. So let me switch here, family. I think I got it here in my screen. Okay. So, all right. So I'm going to play a little bit of it and just let me, let me know if you can um, hear the audio on this. So I'm just going to play a little bit of it. And we're going to just, just do a quick uh, sound check just to make sure that you can hear the audio. So here we go, family. And are known that in, um, you know, to the colonialists, who are the people that actually colonize Britain. All right, family. So if you could hear that family, if you could, please just put a one in the chat. Yeah, just put a one in the chat. If you could hear that audio, please, family. I just want to make sure that. OK, I see ones in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. All right. So we're good. So I'm going to play it. It's going to back it up to the beginning. And again, this is a, uh, you know, a, a researcher. So she's done some research and she's uh, discovered <laughs> She's discovered certain tribes in Yemen and certain tribes in Africa. So let's take a look. Well, the first thing I want to get across is that when you're talking about these people, you're not talking about legendary folk. You're talking about people that are still living under their names and usually, you know, people of African affiliation. So I'm, I entitled this um, Esau on the Trail of Esau Part 2. And the Esau, as I was saying last week, were uh, still call themselves Esau, and are known that in um, you know, to the colonialists, who are the people that actually colonized Britain, colonized the Yemen, uh, um, I guess in the 19th century, and they started writing about the different tribes there. So one of them are the Isa Kara, Kara, or Al Kara, who occupy Oman but whose tribes also occupy or occupied the Yemen, as well as East Africa, East Africa, East Africa. So just so that you can, you can, uh, you're picking up on it family. So she's saying that uh, some of the descendants of Esau can be found in East Africa, East Africa. And that is based off of their name and that is based off of their own oral tradition. 
their own oral tradition, Esau, who remember family, according to the Bible, has a perpetual hatred of Israel. They're over in Yemen and they're over in East Africa. And again, just kind of making making the example, family. You go over to Africa, you we own this this black thing. We're thinking, like, man, ah, uh, who finally found some black folks. And as you as you can see in the picture, these people are black folks in the picture. Not only that, uh, in this particular soundbite, um, I, I didn't capture it in this soundbite, but what she also says is that these people of Esau have a tendency of living in caves. Remember the Horites. Esau mixed with the Horites. So she said that these people, uh, most of the time when you find them, they're living in caves, doing the thing that Esau liked to do. <laughs> so anyway, but again, just uh, want to point that out. So I, let's, keep, let's keep going, family. So for example, all these different tribes or clans are the names of people of Esau or Esau, as they call themselves still, the Esau, Isa or Esau. In Arabic, this is the name of Esau, who we in the West uh, have named Esau. The word Esau or Esau means the goat. Okay. Uh, so they also live in a place called Dama, or what is called Edom. It does mean the red or the red place or the red mountain. They have places called Edom all over the Yemen, sending to even, you know, a little bit north of the Yemen and the Assyria region. So these people were the Edomites, we don't, who I'm showing you right now. But there are many clan names among them, among these Kara people, also pronounced. It's pronounced somewhere between the, the Q and the G of, of, um, of uh, English. So Kara, Kara. Okay, so these people came from Southwest Arabia and immigrated to the Yemen. In the Bible, however, you see the word Korah as one of the Horite people. So Horites, Edomites, if you, if you know Genesis, you'll see that the Horites are the people of Edom or the people of Esau. Okay, so but Makir is also a part of them and he actually was listed as, and that's a tribe on both side, sides of the Red Sea in Somalia, as well as southern, southern uh, Yemen. Makir was a son of Manasseh, who is called Manasir in Arabia. All right, so uh, she's also saying that there's a tribe of Manasseh. Remember the Northern Kingdom? We remember we was talking about the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom? Well, Manasseh was part of the Northern Kingdom, part of the uh, tribe of Israel that had beef or a uh, an issue with Judah. So remember, uh, when we talk about the, the two sticks, you know, one stick re represents the northern kingdom and another stick represents the southern kingdom. And that eventually, according to prophecy, that those two sticks will eventually come together to become one, right? Well, before those sticks come together, become one, there are two sticks <laughs> and they're going to be after each other family. So you know, just keep that in mind. So even the tribe of Manasseh, uh historically has been against judah right against judah so you may want to look out for the people of manessa in those areas manessa ear with the ending ir so manessa of course was an israelite tribe all right so all right let me switch back over to yeah all right there we go switch back over to the presentation so again, so she was just sharing with us family that there are uh, both Esau and Manasseh in uh, like Yemen in East Africa, right? Esau and Manasseh, right? In Yemen and in East Africa. And she goes on and she explains, she gives, she gives more tribes and stuff like that. But like I said, family, you know, her, her, uh, approach is a little bit different, you know, based off of her research because of all the places and names that she's found, you know, she's of the mind that Israel is in Yemen. Um, and of course, you know, many of us believe otherwise. So again, just because I'm playing, it doesn't mean I'm endorsing what she's saying. You know, I'm just trying to give you some information so you can chew the meat, spit out, uh, spit out your bones, spit out the bones. All right. All right. So let's see, do I have another clip? I don't think uh hang on family because i 
Yeah, I think that's it. Because I think the other the other clip that I had, family, I, it has music on it, and I didn't necessarily want it want to trigger uh, a copyright. So what I'm going to do is, yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to read it instead. So what we're going to read, family, is <clears throat> I'm going to show you that in addition to uh, Ephraim being over in East Africa, uh, what I'm going to show you, or in addition to Esau being over in East Africa, I'm going to show you that the black uncut tribe of Esau is also in West Africa. You know, because you do you do have some some people of Esau that was cut with some Horites that have that um, uh, that lighter that lighter skin, and actually there are some uh, people of Esau that are mixed with Horites, but that that still retain their dark skin. But when we take a look at the ones in Esau, the, the descendants of Esau over in West Africa, they are black. They are black, and let's take a look at where they are. So. What we're going to read, this is from um, Elder Remy's book. Uh, let's see, did I capture the name of his book? I apologize, family. I'm going to have to add his the title of his book here later. Actually, this, yeah, I, I forgot to add it on there. <clears throat> My bad, fam. But anyway, but uh, this is, comes from Elder Remy's book. He's from, uh, of the, he's an, an Igbo elder over in Africa. He has uh, many books. He has published many books. But let's read about what he says about some of the um, tribes that are that are around the Igbo. Remember, because a lot of folks, you know, will take will say that, hey, a lot of the people in the states are Igbo, right? We're Igbo of Igbo descent. Well, let's see who is around the Igbo <laughs> in Nigeria. So it reads. I'm gonna start off with the uh, the the highlighted part in yellow. Where it says, "This Igbo led federation." Curiously was not. Oh, hang on. Let me change my screen on my my uh, computer. It says this Igbo led federation curiously was not subjugated by any of its militaristic neighbors like Benny, who to their west had the Yoruba, who have been speculated to to be a conglomeration of the descendants of ancient Canaanites and Egyptians as their neighbors and the Aga Igala who for many years in their histories wage incessant wars with their other neighbors. All right, here we go, family. It says, the Federation had Benny, Benny and its satellites as its neighbors to the West. The Igala and the Idumia, the Igala and the Idumia, who many have ascribed Idumian, Idumian which is Edomite, or the descendants of Edom, origins to, as its northern neighbors. Let me read that again. It says, the Federation had Benny and his satellites to the north, and Igala and, I, I, and Idom, Idoma, whom many have ascribed Idumi, Idumian, Edomite origins to, as its northern neighbors. And remember, the descendants of Esau, so I'll, I'll say this, family, the descendants of Esau, the, the names in the, in the scriptures, Sometimes it's called Idumian or Idumea, right? Uh, or Edom. So, um, and of course, you know, you have an African tribe called, literally called Ido Idoma. Idoma, like Edom, like Idoma. And the thing is, and the thing is, family, is that remember, according to scripture, these people have a perpetual hatred for Jacob, a perpetual hatred for Israel. Like it's not going to stop, family. And just I just want to show you where they're located on the map. So you can see you can see Igbo, right? So you can all say, well, hey, well, maybe I want to move back to Nigeria and live in the territory of the Igbo. Well, look who's right above the Igbo. <laughs> Iduma, Edom, Igala, Edom. That's what I'm saying, family. You don't if you're going over to Africa thinking that that just because they're black, everything's good. You're going to be in for a rude awakening because you don't you don't want to mess up and move into Idoma and they have a perpetual hatred for the most highest people and get caught up. All right. And this is fascinating, family, because, you know, Edom means red. Right. Edom literally means, um, you know, uh, red. And you guys hang on one second, family. 
Uh, you know, because we all know about how Edom was read all over. They said the, the scriptures talk about how Edom was read all over, uh, like a hairy, like a hairy garment. So Esau, here, uh, Esau means hairy. Yep, sorry, fam. I'm just trying to pull up the um, uh, the uh, Strong's Concordance uh, Hebrew word for Esau because I think I just just misspoke here when I said Esau means red. I think Esau means hairy. Hang on. Uh, hang on. Let me look at Strong six two one five. <clears throat> Let's see here, Esau. And uh, how come it didn't show up on mine? All right, so we'll say apparently. So anyway, we'll say that Esau was hairy and shaggy, right? Um, but we also know that Esau was Esau was associated with red. We'll, we'll, we'll say it that way. Esau was associated with red. It was it was uh, red all over like a hairy garment, right? Red all over like a hairy garment. And the thing about these these people that are called the Idoma, right? The Idoma is that their color is red. <laughs> their color is red. Their color is red. So again, you know, pay what we want to do, family, we want to make sure that we're paying attention to the people, right? Paying attention to uh people, uh places. You know, don't want to get we don't want you to be, um, you know, have your have blinders on thinking that just because they're black, everything's going to be good. Uh, and that puts you into a bad situation where you're literally moving into uh, the territory or the neighborhood <clears throat> of Edom, where the scriptures say that they have a perpetual hatred against you. Or you're moving into the territory of Ephraim, where Ephraim still has envy against Judah. Right. Or you're moving into the territory <laughs> Where the, um, uh, the the United States or um, some of the, U the European continents are training the African population, right, and, and indoctrinating them into their uh, beliefs and their culture, right. So just something to keep in mind, family. Like I said, just wanted to put this out, this, this video out, as a um, uh, you know a, a public announcement, <laughs> right. So. Feel free to, to take a look, uh, play it, you know, play it back again, family. Uh, take revisit some of these uh, these references or whatnot. But that is it, family. That is it. Thank you for hanging in there with me, family. I know it was a lot a lot of information, and I believe that's it. I don't think I have any any other slides. Yeah, that's it, family. So peace and blessings, peace and blessings. Hopefully, uh, everyone's uh, doing well, and thank you for dialing in. And uh, like I said, <clears throat> most high willing. You know, we'll see you later on this week. Later on this week, uh, I think as far as like the videos we have lined up, uh, we have some uh, Zakane, some some brothers and sisters uh, that are working uh, through the process, are working on a process uh, for those that are wanting to go over to Africa. Like I said before, you know, there's there's like three camps, right? There's some people that want to go over before uh, Babylon gets judged. Some want to go over during the judgment of Babylon. And some folks uh, like myself plan on going over afterwards but uh you know like you said truth be told family when they tell everybody to get out everybody getting out <laughs> so you're not going to have a have a choice in the matter so we're going to have a you know most high willing we'll have an interesting conversation uh we'll talk about you know some of the challenges that we've that they've run into in the past with some of our brothers and sisters going over to the continent uh you know losing house and money and stuff like that and want to talk through you know how they are trying to guard against that um address it you know uh head on and, and be transparent uh and also see you know see how they're going to be willing to work with you all um if you're interested like i said if you're interested interested in doing that um to get it done so anyway but yeah that's a uh, conversation i think we'll have that teed up for either wednesday or thursday i forgot off the top of my head but i have to look at the calendar calendar and then you know we'll do another uh hidden hebrews hopefully later on in december so that's it, family. Peace and blessings. Thank you for dialing in. Love you, Miss Picard. Love you, family. And enjoy the rest of your day. And shalom. Hello, family. Viewer update. The Benaya Israel channel is moving over to Rumble. 
please join us over on our new platform. You can find a link in the description to our new Rumble channel called Hidden Hebrews. Hope to see you there, family. Shalom.